Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today we are taking a closer look at a historical reenactment scene in Poland. We are here at a medieval fair organized by Foundacja Skrzywa Chwałe, or the Wings of Glory Foundation. It is an enormous event where hundreds of people all across Poland converge to demonstrate the functionalities of the legendary Polish Wing Hussar Cavalry. First up, we will talk to the historian Dr. Krzysztof Japonka about the relationship between the Polish Hussar Cavalry and the Ruthenian Cossack troops during the 17th century. In the Battle of Hotin in 1621, 25,000 Polish troops reinforced by 20,000 Cossacks defeated an Ottoman army. Just a little over 20 years later, the Cossacks rose up against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in one of the bloodiest conflicts in Polish history. As I mentioned, Polish Hussars accompanied all the most important events in Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Indeed, they were everywhere. As we know, they had to move far, far away from Riga and Kotyn. This is where the 44-day-long siege of the Notabene fortress took place. Even though Kotyn was a city in Moldova, it was our battlefield. And during this siege, Hussars were the so-called Called Salvation Military Reserve, which came out of one gate, attacked the Turks and hid back in another place. And then the great crown hetman Stanisław Żukiewski died during the Battle of Sesora, not far away from the borders of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Grand Hetman of Lithuania, Jan Karol Hotkevich, took over the lead. Petro Konashevich Sahaidachny, who brought the number of probably 50 or 60,000 Cossacks, gave Hotkevich's army a hand. But then the Turks attacked, probably because they wanted revenge. But the Cossacks defended the royal camp with unbelievable sacrifice. Sahaidachny used a very important argument in order to persuade them to fight. He said that they are the children of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that this land gave them life, and they had to defend it like their own mother. They brought away the banner of the Mother of God, and each of them kissed it. And the one who kissed it had to go to the war, knowing that he's fighting for faith, for home, and for his own mother. And even if he dies, he'd be a defender of his homeland. This is when the Cossacks stopped their rebellions. Unfortunately, many years later, they decided to rebel because the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth didn't appreciate their contribution. The Polish nobility was the one who wanted to give them the coat of arms, lands and rights because they were financially equal. Both the magnates of Poland and Lithuania, mostly made up of the Russian princes, were against it. They simply said no. We have to remember that the nobility was equal. Even the greatest magnate had as many rights as the nobleman. The magnate's pride didn't allow us to unite with the Cossacks. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was mature enough to unite 50 years later, in 1658, when the Treaty of Hadiach was concluded. If we united right after the Battle of Kotyn, maybe the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth would survive. A famous writer, Albrecht Radziwiłł, said that to kill the Cossacks means to kill yourself. And this is the proof that Cossacks were the children of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but unfortunately unwanted, underestimated and illegitimate. Due to the fact that the state wasn't being able to share with them the splendor of the Commonwealth, it didn't survive. During the Battle of Sesora, the father of Bogdan Khmelnytsky fought alongside Danilovich, and Khmelnytsky himself shielded Hetman Zhukevsky. He was taken captive, but came back after some time. He was an adherent of Ladislaus IV Vaza. He wasn't the opponent of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at first. When preparing the attack on Crimea, Ladislaus I crossed the Cossacks' palm with his wife's Mary Louise Gonzag's huge dowry. Unfortunately, the same stopped this, and Cossacks found themselves in a trap. They joined the Tatars' side because they didn't want to be destroyed by them. And they caused a revolt. What's more, the cannons made in Gdańsk were later used against the soldiers of the Commonwealth. A small branch of the Polish Hussars was destroyed, and in the Battle of Zlotywody, which we can see in Jerzy Hoffman's movie, but Hussars didn't lose the battle. The movie was supposed to show that they couldn't handle it. It was very hard to defend the royal camp. Then the Battle of Piliavci took 
took place when ready to fight nobility ran away from the battlefield as soon as they heard that the Tatars were coming. That caused a breakdown. They covered their losses from 1648 and 1649 in the three-day Battle of Berestechko. That was a disaster for the Tatars. All the relatives of Islam III Giray died. It was also a disaster for Khmelnytsky. The Khan probably tied him up. Khmelnytsky hit him and took him to Crimea as a prisoner, but he released him later on. Unfortunately, a revenge took place after the battle. During the Battle of Batich, Cossacks brought the Polish prisoners out of the Tatars and murdered them in cold blood. After that, there was no forgiveness. Khmelnytsky tried to return to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. He even got the title of Hetman in 1655, but no one believed him. After his death, Hetman Wiehowski concluded a union with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Next up, we will talk to a member of a historical reenactment group specializing in Cossack history about the Cossack contribution during the Battle of Hotin and the reasons behind the 1648 Cossack Rebellion. So as I understand, the Cossacks sometimes fought with the Polish people, but sometimes against them. And I was a little bit curious about how the dynamics between them work. You see, in the Battle of Hotin in uh... 1628, mm -hmm. uh, there was like 10,000 of uh, Cossack troops, if I, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. or more, and they fought on the left flank, mm -hmm. and uh, the Cossacks have a very interesting uh, warfare tactic. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a good cavalry. No? They, no. They, they, all Cossacks knew how to ride the horse, but their cavalry was very weak. Okay. They had uh, old tactics mm -hmm. which w didn't work in the uh, modern, uh, mod uh, early modern uh, uh, combat. Mm -hmm. So they uh, started to make uh, uh, carts, uh, tied them with uh, ropes and uh, they made a fort, a okay. castle of it and then they have very mar big amount of specialized equipment mm -hmm. that uh, was to uh, taking care of uh, the attacks of infantry. Of ten they dig tents under the carts right. and f uh, fought uh, with uh, like uh, very uh, de defensive defensive way of fight. Right. So the Ottomans tried uh, on the Battle of Hojim tried to uh, they think that the morale of the Cossacks is very low right. and they will easily uh, mm -hmm. crush their flank right. and then attack the rest of Polish mm -hmm. Lithuanian Commonwealth sure. Army. Mm -hmm. But uh, so they all of their effort was on the left flank, mm -hmm. but the Cossacks uh, uh, fought very well and they lost their, uh, if I remember correctly, they mm -hmm. lost their Ataman mm -hmm. and the second Ataman, uh, which were, uh, which were um, I don't know, uh, selected, mm -hmm. uh, lost a uh, leg. Oh. In, uh, by uh, the shot of uh, the cannon. Mm. The cannonball took his leg off and still they, uh, they defended. And when the Ottomans was uh, weak from the fighting, uh, the Polish uh, took the way and uh, threw the hussars, threw the hajduks at them right. and they won. The Cossacks even uh, do night attacks mm -hmm. on the, the, the Ottoman stand and right. took very much lives in, this, in those mm. attacks. Because right. the partisan warfare mm -hmm. was their thing. Mm. Uh, but you see, when the clash between Poland and uh, the Poland and uh, Ukraine started, mm -hmm. there is one big thing that started the Khmelnytsky uprising. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, Władysław IV, mm -hmm. the king of Poland, had a plan to uh, restore Roman Empire. Which which of the kings of the uh, of the 70, 60, even 80th century didn't want to do it? Of course. Uh, but uh, he wanted to re revive the Roman uh, Empire, mm -hmm. so he made a plan. Mm -hmm. So he can't start the war as a him, mm -hmm. as him, because sure. he uh, there was this. Uh, democracy of mm -hmm. nobility in sure. Poland, noble dem democracy. Mm -hmm. And if he goes to the, uh, to the meeting and says to all this nobility, mm -hmm. uh, oh, hello guys, I mm -hmm. want to start the war on Turks, <laughs> they will momentarily, instantly yeah, yeah. Li libero li mm -hmm. liberum veto. Mm -hmm. And liberum veto was end of meeting. Yeah, yeah. So he uh, needed a trick to do it. Mm. So he uh, selected, uh, he uh, write to Cossacks and okay. said, prepare for war. We are going full on Turks, 
prepare on war, we have guns for you, we have money, mm -hmm. money from the Polish, uh, the Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth mm -hmm. that was uh, from bank. Mm. It was illegally taken to, and given to the Cossack. And now the Cossack have, has weapons, mm -hmm. and somebody speak, spoke that plan, and it right. was ruined. Uh -huh. And now Cossacks have full weapons. Mm -hmm. They was ready for war. Mm -hmm. They, they didn't, didn't have, uh, have nobody, nobody to go on the war. <laughs> Hmm. So they, with the repressions from mm -hmm. the Polish nobility, mm -hmm. uh, with all those weapons, they mm -hmm. said, "We are going to fr to, fr to free us." Mm. And that, that's how that's one uh, big uh, thing mm -hmm. how it started. Right. There was more, mm -hmm. but this was the first. As we have seen today, there were plenty of challenges and adversaries facing the Polish Lithuanian army in the 17th century. But with enough preparation, superior tactics and armory, the legendary Polish wing hussars were able to secure plenty of victories in pivotal battles, ones such as the Battle of Kirchholm, Klusino, and most importantly and famously, the Battle of Vienna. That's it for today. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History.